The following Connecticut Experience presentation is part of the ongoing partnership between the Connecticut Humanities Council and Connecticut Public Television. Together, we're exploring Connecticut's rich history and culture. Straddling the Connecticut River sits a valley, low and unassuming. A swath of land carved out by glaciers, which left layers of rich soil in their wake. This fertile region and its harvest sustained Native Americans for centuries. Among the valley's wild vegetation was a weed-like plant with large leaves. Local tribes used those leaves for their ancient tradition of pipe smoking. Later, the plant also seduced the colonists who settled in the area. Eventually, the one-of-a-kind Connecticut River Valley tobacco would become highly coveted. This unique tobacco would be used for a new product known as the cigar. Tobacco became one of the state's largest industries, shaping the economies and communities of central Connecticut. The industry of growing and harvesting the valley's tobacco needed countless workers. Local families toiled to cultivate the land. European immigrants pitched in. And soon, laborers came from as far away as the American South and the Caribbean. The conditions they faced sometimes became an issue of controversy. Many went on to settle major ethnic communities of the Hartford area and to provide much of the ethnic diversity that marks Connecticut today. The Connecticut Valley tobacco industry almost disappeared as cigars gave way to cigarettes. But a sudden increase in cigar smoking at the end of the 20th century has given the industry a new life. This is the story of the people and the area known as Connecticut's Tobacco Valley. There's a 60-mile stretch of the Connecticut River Valley from Portland, Connecticut, north to the lower tip of Vermont. This broad, flat bottomland was once the site of what archaeologists call Lake Hitchcock, filled with the meltwaters of the retreating glaciers. Now it has the best farming soil in New England. It was the first place in Connecticut where European settlers came in 1633, establishing the towns of Windsor and Wethersfield. Among the commercial farming products was tobacco, a plant outlawed in the first legal code of the Connecticut colony in 1650. A Puritan song proclaimed, Tobacco's an Indian weed, grows up at dawn, cut down at eve. It reminds us of our decay. We are but clay. Think on this when you drink tobacco. Despite those sentiments, the Indian tobacco used for pipe smoking eventually became the state's top cash crop and an American institution. In fact, among some colonists, it became the lifeblood of commerce, the center of trade and barter, a tradition that would become part of the Connecticut River Valley culture. This tobacco tradition produced much fuel for pipes, but it wasn't until the late 18th century that the idea of cigars descended upon Connecticut's Tobacco Valley. Some traced the birth of the local cigar industry to Connecticut resident Israel Putnam, who, returning from a military expedition in Cuba, brought back with him a cachet of cigars. Soon after, cigar production began in the Connecticut Valley. The first cigars were made by a woman. Her name was Sally Prout. And back in 1803, when they had just mostly the outdoor tobacco and they traded overseas, they couldn't get the pipes that they imported from England. And so, that, so this lady, Sally Prout, would roll the tobacco in a leaf and sort of form the first cigar. And her husband, who uh, peddled like um, tinware and yard goods and sewing things, from door to door with a truck would also peddle these cigars. So then all the women, a lot of the women from the different farms got together and they'd roll and make 
the first cigars. Since the early 1800s, farmers in the Connecticut River Valley have grown tobacco for the outer layers of cigars. The leaves were used for both binding and wrapping. This valley was one of the few places in the world where broadleaf used for binding filler tobacco was grown. Connecticut Valley broadleaf became a serious commercial product. By 1875, the popular Havana seed was introduced and its leaves were used mostly as a wrapper. To this day, Connecticut wrapper is considered the best in the world. Connecticut tobacco was the result of 100 years of trial and error, which produced the finest conditioned soil. They don't seem to be able to replicate it anywhere else. There's something that they, in fact, have not been able to identify that gives this unique region in the Connecticut River Valley from Hartford uh, on northward a remarkable capacity to produce uh, this quality product. Wrapper tobacco is the most expensive because it's what you see, and therefore it has to be in the, in the best shape. It can't have holes in it, it can't look ugly, it has to have a clean, clear color to it. In order to do that, every leaf is, is hand-picked. By doing that, it also has this uh, incredible influence on the taste of a cigar. Connecticut Shade has got the most clean, smoothest uh, tasting tobacco uh, uh, and it blends beautifully with lots of different tobaccos. Late in the 19th century on a large Indonesian island called Sumatra, tobacco characterized by its fine big leaves began taking over the wrapper market. Concerned Connecticut farmers and scientists got some seeds to see if they could grow those leaves in the valley. As it turned out, the Connecticut River soil was perfect, but the leaves were burning up in the sun, unlike in tropical Sumatra, where the conditions were overcast and humid. By 1900, Connecticut researchers developed a unique technique to grow tobacco under shade tents designed to simulate the shade and humidity of Sumatra. The first tents went up on River Road in the Quantic section of Windsor. They were very successful because tobacco is a wet plant and the sides of the tents held the moisture in, the tops of the tent protect them from the sun, and so they got this same great big beautiful plant. That ingenious process would make the Connecticut River Valley one of the planet's finest areas for cigar wrapper. The product was named Shade Tobacco. It flourished during the heyday of cigar use. In 1904, the more cigars smoked than cigarettes. Now think about that. And there were a thousand, two thousand cigar factories all over the country. There were no machines that could make cigars. So they had to be, all be made by hand. So they had cigar factories all over the United States, particularly in the East. Many factories were built right here in Bridgeport, and they prospered. In the beginning, it was done at the home. They were made in people's basements as a sideline to their regular jobs and the demand was so great that they were being paid by piecework. So much for a dozen cigars, whatever it may be. And then they became unionized and then it became a factory operation. It was one of the first crops that was ever utilized in this country. And then we were shipping our tobacco to European ports, to various islands, and it became worldwide. And as time went on, men enjoyed smoking cigars because it relaxed them. You know, you go for a lunch, uh, and or you're at a dinner, and you have a brandy and a cigar. Uh, and it's leisurely, it's sociable. So if you think about it as, as sort of a cultural environment of a particular kind of ritual, I think in movies occasionally you would see the, uh, the barons of industry with cigars during the workday. At the end of the day, you retire to the, to the men's club uh, for a conversation, socializing. Sam Renzulli of Bridgeport smoked cigars for 25 years and collected cigar bands which represented historic figures, cigar factories, as well as national heroes. Many of them are all embossed with pictures of kings and queens and great opera singers and composers and what have you, and also poets. Any people that have ever met, found any recognition, this would be a way of giving them the honor of being on a cigar band. 
So it, it was uh, almost on the order of a calling card. You get two businessmen that are working to make a deal together, and one is saying, I'll do this and you'll do that, and compromise along the way. And when they are through with their conversations, they get together, shake hands, exchange cigars. The popularity of cigars in the early 1920s helped establish both the broadleaf and shade tobacco industries. More than 30,000 acres were being harvested annually for tobacco in Connecticut. Tobacco farmers often pass their farms along from generation to generation. My ancestors grew tobacco from the early days, maybe even from the colonial days, tobacco of one form or another, and it was following the Civil War, I think, when it grew to be more of a, more of a real business venture rather than a backyard you know, type of a crop. And it was around the turn of the century, I think around 1910 to be exact, at, at the first shade tobacco tents were put up here in, in Windsor, and I think that my family was among the first to put up shade tents. All my uncles on both sides of the family, the Thralls and the Clarks, they all uh, were in the tobacco business. These gentlemen, all of whom grew their own tobacco, just loved it. I mean, and they, they, they took such pleasure in seeing that plant grow from tiny little bits of seeds that you could hardly see with the naked eye until they became these nine foot, eight foot tall plants, all in a period of about eight weeks. You could almost see the things grow. The tobacco farmer's day was long and the living was simple. They liked each other. Uh, they, there was no sense of competition. I mean, not in the fierce type of competition we think of in terms of industry. And they talked to each other and they met with each other. And about all they talked about were was, what was the farm and their tobacco and problems that they had. And they would share the good things. If they discovered something that would like, save a little labor or might make the leaf a little bit better, they would share that with each other. And uh, of course, many of them were related to each other in one fashion or another, because many of these families went way back. The one thing I remember, I always knew when it was spring, because my father would come home with these huge pans. They looked like pie pans to me, but they were filled with dark, rich soil, and itty bitty seeds in those pans, and those were the tobacco seeds, he told me. And he would take them in our basement and put them up on the hot water pipes. That was his homemade hothouse. Uh, and then every night we would go down and check those little seeds to see if they were popping up. And uh, after they got to be a certain height, maybe an inch and a half, two inches, he would take them out to the farm and put them in his tobacco beds. It takes a great many of these seed beds to start enough plants for the average farm. Hundreds of glass top frames under which the tiny plants will be carefully nurtured until they are big enough to take their places in the field. Not so very big now, are they? Just tiny green shoots, barely visible to the eye. But in a few short weeks, the growing plants are already crowding each other in the bed. In those days, they still had horses. And uh, the men sat on the back, and they planted the uh, plants in the fields. And he always pointed out to me how straight they were. No time to lose now. The tobacco must be set in the fields without delay. Ingenious planting machines crawl slowly across the field. Four experienced setters ride behind and drop the plants into furrows with a steady rhythm. Automatically, this mechanical marble digs the furrow, supplies just enough water, and closes the trench around the roots of the plants at just the right depth. The first leaves to appear on a stalk are discarded as the plant stretches upward. Two months after the transplanting, the harvest begins as the plants yield a total of 18 leaves each. This tobacco here, which has beautiful, beautiful leaves here, these leaves are picked two or three at a time from the bottom up. So they go through this field six or seven times to get all the leaves off. You snap a leaf off like that, and the leaf is ready to put, it, put on the ground here. With a, now we have a much easier way. We have a canvas that runs down through the, through the lot that puts the leaves on that canvas, and we have a bicycle type of motion that pulls that whole canvas in. In the old days, we used to drag the basket through the field 
and then take the, put the tobacco in the basket and then take the, the basket out of the field and brought it to the shed. And the smell of the charcoal fires and the tobacco curing is something that's always stayed with me. It's, uh, and there's nothing else like it any place I've ever been. Tens of thousands of acres of gauze tenting once spread across the valley's farms. Hundreds of long wooden tobacco barns with special shuttered sides that can be opened or closed to affect moisture and temperature for curing dotted the landscape. To the women from the surrounding villages and the schoolgirls employed during the summer goes the work of stringing the leaves on wooden laths for hanging. Feminine hands are well adapted to this light job. With lightning-like speed, the needle and string move through the tobacco with all the skill of the professional seamstress. The process has changed little in the last 60 years. Okay, once the tobacco is moved from the field in those uh, trailers and in the basket, as you can see, it, it's very important that it reach the, the tables here sound and clean as it left the field. Breakage is our worst enemy, and that's something that we have to continuously look after. Once that is done, they take it in a small pot and put it upside down for the girls to sew it. And they would take it like this, one pair at a time, just facing, leave facing each other, and just the machine will do the sewing. And then it is handled and it's hung all the way to the top. But after the tobacco has been hung in the shed, we usually let it wilt for a couple of days and we feel that uh, it becomes kind of silky and uh, it's pliable, meaning the tobacco is wilting. So by that time, we should expect to see some sign like this that the tips of the leaves are getting yellowed up to one inch. And that's when we are calling the shed and say, okay, let's start the curing process, which is firing the shed with the propane gas. Now, this is where the fun begins, curing the tobacco, getting from that green color that we saw in that prior shed, and getting into the golden brown color, even, and drying the veins uh, properly so that when you actually wrap up a cigar, it's a cosmetic issue that has to go with it. But on top of that, it's a quality issue because if we dry it too fast, we fix the green color, so there will be no flavor, that we, the same flavor that we are looking for, and we couldn't process it. So this is actually, as I said before, the curing starts right with the tip. So two things have to happen. There will have to be a change in color. We call it from green to lime, from lime to orange, from orange to brown. And it has to be in stages. We cannot actually just jump. And uh, the humidity here is high. So we try at this time of the curing, it's close to probably 90%. And we need to keep that so that it's a slow process of the curing. Nothing here is to be rushed. And only the tobacco, every day as we go in and out, he will let us know. The tobacco will let us know when to raise the temperature, when to open the windows. As you can see, we have windows all uh, at the bottom. And the reason is to create a chimney effect, to get fresh air, heat it up, and take it all the way through the roof. And by doing so, the air, as you can see the tobacco, very gently moving, that air will go through the tobacco, the hot air, between the leaves, and that's how the tobacco is to be cured. And this is just the beginning. Well, now you can see what happens to the tobacco. We have just a green leaf. It's now been heated up with the heaters that are down here on the ground with propane heat. We used to do it by with charcoal, and before that with coal. It was a much more efficient way of doing it. The barns get up to 100 degrees of heat, and it takes about five or six weeks in the shed like this to cure the tobacco. And this tobacco has now turned color. You can see the color now is brown. And it, it, from this time, it then has to be taken down, put in piles, and brought, sent down to the Dominican Republic, where it's, again, heated up in bulks to about 3,200 pounds, where those, and that, and it's turned three or four times. Those bulks get up to 110, 115 degrees. And after another five weeks in those bulks, is taken out, shaken out, and then sorted into about 15 different grades and about 10 different sizes. And after that, it's tied in hands and put into bales. And then those bale, <coughs> bales are put aside, and two years later, that tobacco is ready to be put on a cigar. And with our Macanudo cigars, that tobacco sometimes goes three and four years because we think it's such an important thing to cure that tobacco. Because age is the best thing, just like me. Older I get, the better I get, 
The older tobacco is, the better it is. I'm going to take a leaf off this lath with <coughs> every, uh, all the tobacco is put on the lath. And then I'm going to take that leaf and strip it so we can put it on a cigar. It goes up there and goes up the end there. Put it around my rest like that. I take the rest of it out just like this. And there's a, there's a wrap of it. Then you can take that leaf, put it on the cigar, and it's the wrapper of the cigar. And you can see how we can do this. We can wrap that cigar around and around, and it's going to go on this cigar. And I can tell you, if any of you in the audience want to try this, it would be a very good idea for you to try it, but I don't think you'd be very successful. It's only taken me 50 years to know how to do this. Broadleaf and especially shade farmers made substantial capital investments in order to set up all the processes needed to cultivate tobacco. You're not going to get rich, but you will make a, make a living. The only thing, you've got to have a good partner. And I, I, I mean your wife. You've got to understand that when you're poor, uh, don't get a good crop, you don't spend any money. When you get a good crop, then, then you spend money. It was a gamble because it depends so much on the weather. You know, if, if uh, you had a, a, a plant that was growing up uh, and, and that you're taken care of and nurtured, you know, like you would almost a child, and then along would come a hailstorm, and bang, put hailstones right through the leaves. That was the end of that leaf, and sometimes the end of the whole crop. Now the wary farmer keeps an ever watchful eye on the weather. So far, he has controlled it, made it work for him. But New England weather can be a tricky enemy too, especially in summer. The biggest worry now is a furious wind or hailstorm which can wipe out his entire year's work in a single hour. One more risk which must be taken in the growing of shade-grown tobacco. This looks like a bad one, clouds piling up fast. The first gust of heavy wind and rain. And here it comes, nature on the rampage. One million dollars damage. One of my uncles used to raise tobacco back in 27, 28, 29. That's the year of the big hailstorm, 29. Then he went broke. Much of the work to do all over again. Luckily, the plants, for the most part, are unharmed, but the tents are in rags. What does the tobacco farmer do after a catastrophe like this? Start over again, of course. As a matter of fact, he considers himself lucky. If the plants had been larger, the hail would have torn them to shreds. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. The, the man above makes it. There's no way. You can irrigate, you stand on your head, but if he uh, decides we're not going to have a good wet year or a good growing season, that's it. It's very uh, labor oriented. And its back of leaf is handled, I don't know how many times, maybe a dozen or more times before it's finally ready for for its uh, ultimate use. The tobacco industry required far more labor than farmers and their families could provide. At different times, it was provided by local youth, European immigrants, black and white students from the South, and workers from the Caribbean. Conditions for tobacco workers have often been a subject of controversy. Growers seeking to attract workers and cultivate public opinion have frequently portrayed conditions as healthful and bucolic. Critics seeking to organize workers and force changes in working and living conditions have often painted a grim picture of tobacco workers' lives. Among the first field hands to be recruited were European immigrants, but on the eve of World War I, these immigrants, many of whom were Polish, began to leave the tobacco fields for their homelands or for better paying jobs in war industry factories. Desperate for labor, the tobacco farmers asked the National Urban League, an organization established to aid black migrants, to help find black workers for the tobacco fields. 
In 1915 alone, the Urban League recruited more than 1,400 young students to Connecticut from schools in Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. In the decades after World War I, local youth took to the fields and eventually became one of the major contributing groups in the tobacco labor force. And I went to work, I was 14, and I went to work in the fields, as almost every young man, boy, did in this area uh, in the summer times, uh, simply because it was the only type of work we could do. And you could begin to work in agriculture when you were 14. Everyone in town worked tobacco when they were a boy. There was no such thing as not working. <laughs> and every boy was looking for a job, they got a job. Either handing tobacco, spearing tobacco, or hanging tobacco. I have never been laid off for, for the lack of work, and I've never looked for another job. When local recruits ran low, the tobacco farmers brought in young workers from other states for seasonal labor. This excerpt from a promotional film narrated by Lowell Thomas portrays a tobacco plantation as akin to a summer camp. Midsummer. And with the harvest just around the corner, the high school and college girls from out of state are arriving at the camp. They'll work in the curing shed. But for the most part, they consider their stay on Connecticut tobacco farms an interesting vacation work experience. Some of the camps are on lakes, others in the rolling Connecticut countryside. But wherever they are, they provide the opportunity to work, play, and learn the basic principles of getting along with people. Without the help of these young people, the local workers could never handle the crop at the speed with which it must be harvested. This promotional film portrayed the importation of foreign workers as a contribution to international social welfare. A migration of workers like this provides problems for our farmers. Living quarters must be provided. Ample provision must be made for good food. Recreation and supervision must be carefully planned. The folks from other states and other lands will make the tobacco farms their summer home, and clean, comfortable dormitories make their stay pleasant and enjoyable. North and South work together in peaceful harmony. People of other states and other lands pitch in on a common problem. The Connecticut farmer's solution to his labor problem represents a triumph in social relations of national and international significance. During World War II, the local workforce was depleted as young men left their tractors for military tanks and battleships. Once again, the tobacco industry was forced to find labor elsewhere. They first looked to the American South, reviving the tradition of black students on Connecticut tobacco farms. We had housing for them. There were dormitories for both girls and boys. The girls did the sewing in the shed, and the boys did the picking of the tobacco. And they were wonderful workers. We, had, we really were very proud of what we did with them. We had camps that we built a swimming pool for them. Among the migrants was a 15-year-old student heading to Morehouse College in Atlanta by the name of Martin Luther King, Jr. In his letters to his mother, King would talk about his experiences in the Hartford area. Dear Father, I'm very sorry I'm so long about writing, but I've been working most of the time. We're really having a fine time here, and the work is very easy. We have to get up every day at 6. We have very good food, and I'm working kitchen, so you see I get better food. We have service here every Sunday about 8 o'clock, and I'm the religious leader. We have a boys' choir here, and we're going to sing on the air soon. Sunday, I went to church in Simsbury. It was a white church. I could not get to Hartford, but I'm going next week. The white people here are very nice. We go to any place we want and sit anywhere we want to. Tell everybody I said hello and I'm still thinking of the church and reading my Bible. And I'm not doing anything that I would not do in front of you, your son. Black students like King greatly assisted the tobacco workers. But with the war raging on, more help was needed. The local industry required as many as 13,000 seasonal workers so farmers also looked to poverty-stricken Jamaica. Many of the men looked as, upon themselves as soldiers, as though they were coming, they, this was their war effort. They were making a contribution to the war. And um, 
they they were looked upon that way even when they were working on the tobacco farms because they lived in camps in very similar situation as though you were at war you were actually fighting the war and also they had a lot of pride the warm weather migrants often had a difficult time adjusting to new england culture as well as the weather sometimes living conditions in work camps made the experience even more difficult jamaicans tried to adapt to their new surroundings after all often they made more than they could at home the next wave of migrant workers came from Puerto Rico. The island already had an especially strong connection with the Connecticut River Valley tobacco industry. Three of the largest Connecticut tobacco companies owned or leased plants in Puerto Rico's tobacco region. And more than a thousand contract workers to Connecticut came from this region. In 1947, the Department of Labor of Puerto Rico created a migration division and began recruiting workers for mainland farming including thousands for Connecticut tobacco fields. In 1955, it opened an office in Hartford. Because of the end of the Second World War, there was a lot of opportunities in the United States of work, and many of the people in Puerto Rico that were unemployed and that used to live in the countryside went to the United States to find better employment there than here in Puerto Rico. What once was a trickle of migrants to the United States became a flood as the Puerto Rican government actively recruited workers for several states, including Connecticut. The Department of Labor in Puerto Rico would go around in sound trucks, encouraging people to meet at a specific place, and then would literally send them, often the next day, to Bradley or to uh, La Guardia uh, or to Logan airports, where they would be picked up by somebody representing uh, the Department of Labor in, the, in that specific state, and would bring them to the farms. The Shade Tobacco Growers Association was looking for Puerto Ricans who were strong, healthy, and willing to work on arrival. Thousands of laborers were housed in northern Connecticut and Massachusetts camps. Many of the men left extended families to come and do back-breaking work in apple orchards and tobacco farms. Workers often learned that contracts might save one thing, but the reality was quite different. They didn't have no privacy in the camps. Especially people have to live above the other and they didn't have no separate door to they can have the privacy there or whatever. And also inside of the bad system, they don't work completely in a hurt condition. It was terrible. At lunchtime, people used to, some, some people used to get sick out of the half that kind of small kind of sardine, slab of bread and orange. I just came from Puerto Rico to here, it was 75 cents an hour. A hundred years, those ground had the same type of chemical product. That's why you saw a lot of people, especially poor people with skin cancer. According to files in the Puerto Rican archives in San Juan, many of the recruited were misunderstood, labeled as dummies, and shipped to farms across the country. Among the recruits was Artemio Borges Lopez, contract C-5886 of San Lorenzo, who arrived at Camp Bradley, Connecticut in 1954. In his letters to the Department of Labor, Lopez wrote, I suffer from ulcers and I feel a lot of pain all over my body, and I have an itch that's destroying me. When I go to the bathroom, my body drains blood, and I'm without a penny to return to Puerto Rico. I don't want to die here, and I have nine orphan children and a second wife who I can't send any money to. So please do something for me because my company does nothing to help. We came to Connecticut because my father was hired as a chaplain for the migrant workers. My dad would take all of us to the, uh, when he went to the, to the camps, he would take the whole family, the five of us, um, because the men were so lonely and those camps were so barren. They were awful, you know? And I remember packaging, uh, like care packages with toothbrushes and, and um, towels and, and toothpaste and just the most basic needs and he, he, he filled his whole station wagon up with stuff and, and we'd spend most of our evenings just kind of talking to the migrant workers uh, in the tobacco camps. In this advocate documentary, Puerto Rican activists came to Windsor to check out the conditions on the farms. This film portrayed conditions in Connecticut tobacco farms as highly exploitive. 
These scenes depict one of the most shameful and least talked about aspects of the American way of life, the migrant workers' camps. Each year, more than 50,000 Puerto Ricans join the ranks of these workers who live right in the heart of the United States, subject to inhuman exploitation. The owners of these work camps don't want the people to know the truth, as this film crew found out. And we are uh, asking you if we could come in and visit the camp to see where our comrades live and the conditions and Unless whatnot. Unless you got permission from the, uh, with the yeah, management yeah, yeah. of the camp, you, I cannot let you on the ground. The management? Right. Is that easily accessible? Uh, I don't permission. know. Here he comes right now. We came to visit our comrades outside today, and we wanted to know if we could no. visit the ground, see the no. conditions they live in. No. Is some problem why we can't? No. Executive Director of the Shade Tobacco Growers Agricultural Association. We need large numbers of people, first of all. And Puerto Rico is the uh, most available supply of large numbers of workers, not only for the growers here in Connecticut, but uh, all through the Northeast. ¿Cuántos años hace que está haciendo este trabajo de migrantes? Como diez años. Diez años. El más malo es este. El más malo es este. ¿Por qué es que hace este trabajo? Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué trabajo hacía en Puerto Rico? Porque hay poco allá. No hay trabajo allá. Poco, poco. Ajá, entonces se ve obligado a venir aquí. Eh, son siete hijos, mucho gasto. Drawing such an immense and diverse workforce, the tobacco industry often faced laborers' rights issues. As long ago as the end of World War I, black women who worked in the industry organized a union. In the 1960s, a number of religious and political groups helped Puerto Rican migrants to organize and improve working and living conditions in the tobacco farms. The farm workers, they saw the need in organizing and creating an organization that would respond to the needs of, 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 of for services for the, all the needs that they had at the, at the time. Uh, so basically, you know, employment as they made the transition from the farms to the city, so this office uh, throughout New England was very uh, effective in, in helping them to make that tr transition by helping them to get jobs in the cities and going into ESL programs like English as a second language and all these other health situations where they needed uh, services. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, agencies and growers cooperated in order to improve conditions on the farms. An early 1990s television program made by the Connecticut State Labor Department portrayed conditions on tobacco farms as habitable, workers as satisfied, and employers as benevolent. Buena limpieza, este, los baños son sumamente cómodos, las camas son sumamente cómodas. Este, las camas, hey, tenemos nuestra privacidad, la pasamos bien. Si alguno de ustedes está interesado en venir para acá, venir para acá a trabajar, me aconsejo que es bueno. No hay, tú me entiendes, no hay que preocuparse uno porque todito está a la mano. Me gusta el trabajo aquí y creo que a ustedes también les va a gustar. Oh, the, these facilities mostly are on our own farms and we had them built and we built them very properly. Naturally, a happy person is going to give you a lot more work than one that's not happy. When you walk down the center corridor, what we have is cubicles set up where four men are in a cubicle and it's bunk beds on each side. The people that come up and work for us, as far as we're concerned, are almost like family. We work with them all day, they work with us all day. And hey, you go home after a hard day's work, you want to have a nice place to go relax, just like going to your own home. Over the course of the century, the influx of migrant tobacco workers profoundly affected the demographics of the Connecticut Valley population. Many of the most important ethnic communities in the Hartford area got their start from pioneers who went to work in the Connecticut Valley tobacco fields. For example, in 1915, letters from Southern black students, as well as newspaper reports, trumpeted opportunities on Connecticut farms, stimulating one of the first waves of the Great Migration. These migrants often came from the same communities in the South. As they established themselves in the North, they started churches and other organizations that would become key institutions in Hartford's black community. A lot of the people who came to work in this area, picking tobacco and in the nurseries and in the fruit farms, often ended up in Hartford. 
uh, and taking over the neighborhoods that had belonged to the French Canadians, to the Irish, uh, as they moved out of the out of the cities. Along with the new black neighborhoods, Puerto Rican and Jamaican communities were born. West Indian social clubs were started, providing them a sense of identity. Today, those communities are evident on Albany Avenue in Hartford, as well as in the town of Bloomfield. It's very noticeable if you go through those areas to see the West Indian flavor of the area. They brought with them their culture. So they brought with them their foods, the kinds of music, and then they brought their families to live here. And of course, the families gradually exploded into what they think now is about 45,000. Most of the men now do not have anything related to tobacco. Most of the men, there are lots of entrepreneurs. They um, start their own businesses. So if you go up Albany Avenue, go on Blue Hills Avenue, you'll find the Scott's Bakery, you'll find the Sammy's Beauty Mart, you'll find barbers and um, you know food stores. And then their this first, second generation kids, they became very professional. So you'll find another whole, you know, accountants, attorneys, physicians. It's, it's a wide cross-section of um, professions that you'll find in the area. Have you ever noticed the smooth brown outside wrapper of a fine cigar? Chances are it was made from the mild and delicately flavored tobacco leaves grown right here in Tobacco Valley. Leaves which wrap eight of every 10 cigars smoked in America today. That was until 1953 when a new invention made it possible to produce binder and wrapper out of finely ground up tobacco mixed with an adhesive. The synthetic wrapper hurt shade growers. The special qualities of the Connecticut Valley tobacco became less important and the decline of the industry accelerated. In World War II, I think the ration kits actually always included a pack of cigarettes. Uh, so it became really the, the, the common form of consumption. In fact, it was in the early 1930s that cigarette use began to consume more than 50% of the tobacco crop. Um, uh, so that there is this transition towards the cigarette uh, that, goes, uh, that goes on that has to do with lifestyle, it has to do with cultural perceptions, it has to do with marketing. I think of the 50s, you know, it's the Ozzy and Harriet period uh, where socialization probably took place a great deal more in people's homes, um, dinner parties, uh, and so on. So you don't have the same kind of context uh, for cigars. Meanwhile, the tobacco industry was steadily shrinking due to automation, the movement of production elsewhere, and above all, the decline of the cigar industry. Eventually, manufacturing industries moved into the Connecticut Valley area, and farmers got good money for their land. Tobacco acreage in Connecticut diminished from a high of 31,000 in 1921 to 2,000 acres in the early 1990s. In 1993, cigar consumption fell to the lowest annual total since the Cigar Association of America began keeping records. The sale of premium cigars, hand-rolled and costing more than $2.50, made a turnaround and started to rise with the return of affluence. Well, actually, I think probably the 1980s was the period in which um, we, you know, we validated getting rich again. As uh, the economy has recovered, um, as people have gotten better off, you begin to replicate the kind of environment of the late 19th century with these specialty um, establishments, uh, single malt whiskeys, uh, and uh, specialty cigars. It also became a, a form of conspicuous consumption because uh, a single cigar can be quite expensive. The cigar had again become an American icon. It becomes the ritual of socialization. You know, we don't dance anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what, what do we do to socialize? perception is there's been a tremendous decline in home entertainment. Uh, two career families, all of the pressures, um, you don't invite people over to the house anymore. You know, you go out and if you think about it, it's a social environment, uh, it's leisurely, uh, you don't smoke it at home. 
you go to a special place, uh, not confined to, to, to men now, men and women. Magazine ads and TV shows like the General Cigar promotional video promoted cigar smoking as pleasurable and classy. It isn't until they talk about it and until people are seen in magazines posing with their little cigars that the rest of the country starts thinking that it's cool and it's all about a trend. Everything about the entertainment industry and everything about uh, this business is about what's trendy, who's trendy and who's not, and what's hot and what's not. Cigars and a cigar separately or singularly is one of the great joys of my whole life. Well, we only pass this way one time, and it's, it should be a pleasurable journey. Something like a good cigar every once in a while makes the trip that much better. You know, sort of stuff that bothered you during the day and stuff that's unimportant kind of melts away. Society's changed a lot, and it's very technological and very fast. Now you have to you feel like you have to keep up with the changes and with your PC and your modem and your mobile phone and all that stuff. And I guess cigars is just a nice way to relax and, and uh, feel a connection to the past. Babe Ruth was a cigar smoker, and he was a home run hitter. In 1990, the sale of premium cigars nearly tripled from their 1987 level. In 1996 alone, premium cigar sales rose 64%. We call it the renaissance, uh, and it really occurred about 1994. Uh, it came out of nowhere. Uh, I think it has its real roots in uh, the economy, of course. A whole generation of, uh, of young people grew up without cigars as a reference. Um, cigars have always been a uh, part of the United States and part of uh, U.S. history. A whole generation of cigar smokers actually adopted cigars as if they discovered them uh, uh, all over again. Uh, and it became very, very popular. And today it is still very popular. It isn't quite the same uh, extraordinary enthusiasm that was there before. There were a lot of people that were caught up in it as a fad. but we. We are now have a business in the cigar industry for premium cigars is three times larger than it was before uh, 1994. Despite all the growing of tobaccos all over the world, the most sought after wrapper is Connecticut shade tobacco. It's quite a remarkable thing if you think about it. Because that's, people want it and they look for it and spend more money to get a Connecticut wrapped cigar. In mid-1997, National Public Radio reported that cigar consumption had jumped by 45 percent over the previous four years, and tobacco prices were at historic highs. They also reported that tobacco acreage in Connecticut had doubled since 1992, not to mention the creation of cigar bars and tobacco shops. 1746. First, I'm going to show you a very popular type of cigar. It's an Ashton cigar. It's made in the Dominican Republic, and it has a Connecticut shade wrap. That's the lighter style wrap that you'll see. Second, I'll show you a difference. This is a CAO Anniversario cigar. You'll notice how it's a lot darker in color. That's made with a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper. It gives it a little bit more of a punch to it. And then I'll show you a 100% Connecticut cigar. This is an old time topper cigar made from 100% Connecticut broadleaf. We have probably the best of both worlds. You come in and we have a great selection of cigars for people to choose from, uh, Dominican cigars, Nicaraguan, Honduran. Um, they come in, they buy a cigar, and either they leave and they'll smoke it wherever they want, or they actually can come back. And we have the Havana Lounge in the back, which is a full liquor licensed uh, cafe. So you go back and it's a real enjoyable, mellow place to hang out and enjoy a cigar. There's cigars that are 12 inches long and over an inch uh, wide. The cigars that are uh, flavored for women, and very petite cigars for women to smoke. Um, they're very strong cigars for guys who've been smoking cigars for a long time. There's mild cigars for the first time guy. So whatever your particular taste is in tobacco, there's certainly a cigar for you. The cigar industry estimates that more than 10 million Americans, the overwhelming majority of them men, regularly smoke cigars. A 1998 study found that the number of cigar smokers had risen 50% since 1993. Despite the renaissance, tobacco is still risky business. In the last few, few years, the most important disease of both broadleaf and shade tobacco has been blue mold. Um, 1997, we had a, a pretty large epidemic of, of this fungus, which is uh, it's an obligate parasite. It only attacks living tobacco plants. 
uh, can cause um, lesions, um, cell death, which makes it um, unsuitable for cigar wrapper production. The summer of 2000 brought a fungus called brown spots, which knocked out much of the Connecticut broadleaf crop. All of Stanley Waldron's crop was affected and had to be buried, leaving nothing but dry, dusty soil and an insurance claim which will cover only some of his costs. It's a perfectly good weed when we started out with it. And now you can see the spots here, 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 here. And when it's finished curing, it'll look like, look like this. Uh, be some holes and some not. And it gets real, real bad, it turns into this. That's what and happens when it gets really bad. Real bad this is the beginning of the spots after it's cured down. And you can't even use that, can you? You can't use it for a wrapper, and you won't be able to use it for a binder. No. It's a very big problem because they want, they want to be able to produce cigar wrapper leaves. And like blue mold, these lesions make it unsuitable for wrapper. When, when these leaves are cured down, they have to be elastic to stretch around the cigar. And the lesions not only are unsightly, but they don't stretch, they tear, so that they would make holes and, and they can't be used. Health concerns are also affecting cigar consumption. A 1998 report by the National Cancer Institute found that regular cigar smoking can cause cancers of the mouth, larynx, esophagus, and lungs, depending on the frequency of use. In June 2000, the nation's largest cigar companies agreed with federal regulators to place health warning labels on cigar packaging and advertising. Despite the controversies over tobacco's impact on health, the effect of the weed on the Connecticut River Valley is undeniable. We were able to employ people and give a lot of benefit to the agriculture, buying our, our fertilizer, buying our tractors, all the cars we need to have, all bought from the local distributors here. <clears throat> so we, we put a lot of money into the community here. <clears throat> I think that has been a help to Hartford. Today's labor force includes many Central Americans, as well as Africans, Haitians, Mexicans, and a few remaining Puerto Ricans. Some say they are fortunate to have the opportunity. Sammy Tobia, a Mexican worker and a father of four, has worked at General Cigar for three years. The truth is there were few jobs and you don't make much. It takes 10 Mexican pesos to make one American dollar. The work I do here is pretty good. The jobs are good and easier than in Mexico, and they treat you well. We make more hourly. Six dollars and thirty cents an hour. Now what we're having is that the farmers uh, are reaching out for undocumented workers from Florida, and they are replacing a lot of the workers that have been in the camp. Uh, or we're coming from the city to go to camp on the seasonal work. And that's presenting a problem. For us it's presenting a problem because our only concern is to provide for those that are there. But because they're afraid and they can't come forward, they cannot be made eligible by, by the mandate of the federal government, then they're out there and we can't serve them. The tobacco industry served as a magnet for a succession of ethnic and racial groups who have become a permanent part of Connecticut life and who have given the Hartford area a diversity of population and culture unusual in the New England region. Leading the success of the industry are the cigar lovers, men and women who enjoy the flavor, feel, and aroma of fine cigars. Like Hartford celebrity Mark Twain, who on his 70th birthday quipped, I have made it a rule never to smoke more than one cigar at a time. But beyond the cigar aficionado, Connecticut tobacco success has depended on a multitude of people working and toiling behind the scenes. The laborers and farmers who have earned their living in the rich soil of Connecticut Tobacco Valley. I do it all over again. Well, it's just something that you like to do and you just even if you know you 
may not make any money if you make a living. What's the difference when you're on this earth? That's all you're going to end up with is a living and a way. program was part of the Connecticut Experience Series, co-produced by Connecticut Public Television and the Connecticut Humanities Council.